Welcome back. And now let's take a look at the news in detail. We start from Iran, where five people have been killed and 120 injured after a 5.9 magnitude earthquake struck the northwestern Iran, northwestern Iran this morning. Provincial Governor Mohammad Razapur Mohammadi, he says that at least 30 houses have been destroyed and the dead toll may rise. Provincial officials say rescue operations are currently underway. The U.S. Geological Survey says that 10-kilometer deep tremor centered 60 kilometers from the town of Hastrud in East Azerbaijan province. It said the shallow depth amplified the impact. There have been several aftershocks reported since the main tremor. In Iraq, 13 more protesters have been killed, pushing the death toll in the month-long unrest to almost 300. Prime Minister Adil Abdul Mahdi remains defiant as violent protests demanding his resignation spread across the country. Medics say six people were shot dead when protesters attempted to storm Baghdad's diplomatic green zone. Crowds were trying to remove barriers near two bridges, providing access to the zone, which houses government offices and foreign embassies. Medics say 35 others were wounded in clashes near the capital city's Shuhada Bridge. Elsewhere, seven others were gunned down during a sit-in in the southern city of Basra. In southern Iraq, protesters have again forced the country's main port to close after it briefly opened for shipping. Sudan's protest movement has agreed to form the country's new parliament only after signing a peace deal with rebel groups. They hope the decision will end long-running conflicts in the country's three border regions. The protest movement, the Forces of Freedom and Change Alliance, says it is keen to form the new assembly on November 17th. But a rebel leader confirmed parliament will now be formed after a peace agreement has been reached. The 300-member parliament was to be formed within three months of the power-sharing deal signed on August 17th. The deal was signed between protest leaders and generals who seized power after toppling President Umar al-Bashir. The Pentagon says revenue from oil fields in northeastern Syria will go to the U.S.-backed forces rather than the United States itself. Pentagon spokesman Jonathan Hoffman says the money will go to the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces. Now, Hoffman also says that United States expects Turkey to hold any forces accountable if they commit war crimes in northeast Syria. He added that the U.S. will continue to support SDF fighters in the fight against ISIS. The SDF are our partners, and, our, and we are still working with them in our, our fight against ISIS, and we're still going to provide them with the support and ability to be able to continue that fight against ISIS. A U.S.-led naval coalition has officially begun operations to protect shipping in the Gulf. Australia and Britain are the main Western countries that agreed to escort Gulf shipping. The commander of U.S. naval forces in the Middle East, Vice Admiral Jim Malloy, he said the alliance will operate as long as naval routes are deemed unsafe. He said the Operation Sentinel is a defensive measure to protect Gulf waters. While Sentinel's operational threat, the operational design is threat-based, it does not threaten. We employ capable warships on patrol, but there is no offensive line of effort in this construct, other than a commitment to defend each other if attacked. The UN General Assembly has passed a resolution calling on the US to end its 60-year-old blockade of Cuba. 187 member states voted against Washington's economic, commercial and financial embargoes on the island. Brazil and Israel joined the US in voting against the resolution, while Colombia and Ukraine abstained. The motion has passed for a 28th straight year. Cuba's Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez Perilla has called the blockade an act of genocide. Palestine's envoy said the impact of the U.S. blockade amounts to $4 billion a year. The Caribbean community says the embargo is an aberration in the era of global cooperation. The sanctions regime is rooted in the Cold War when Fidel Castro and his revolutionaries seized power.
Germany and NATO have rejected a disparaging description of the alliance made by French President Emmanuel Macron. The U.S. also declared NATO partnership critical. This report has more. Speaking alongside NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg in Berlin, Merkel said Macron used drastic words. She said NATO remains a cornerstone of European security. The French president has chosen drastic words. That is not my point of view regarding the cooperation with NATO. I think such a sweeping swipe is not necessary, even though we do have some problems and have to sort ourselves out. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg welcomed Germany's commitment to NATO. I welcome Germany's plan to raise its defense budget and welcome the fact that we have already started to do so. I count uh, on Germany to keep up the momentum and stand by its commitments. The United States also rejected French President Emmanuel Macron's view. At a joint news conference in Germany with German Foreign Minister Hiko Maas, Pompeo said that NATO remains a critical partnership. I think NATO remains an important, critical, perhaps historically one of the most critical strategic partnerships uh, in all of recorded history. In an interview, the French president had described NATO as brain dead. In France, police have evacuated over 1,600 migrants from two camps in northern Paris. It is the biggest operation of its kind in the city for years. French police conducted the operation after the government published new tough measures on immigration. Nearly 600 police officers escorted people from tents where coaches took them to reception centers. Many occupants said they came from Afghanistan and sub-Saharan Africa. Earlier, French Prime Minister Edouard Philippe said the government wants to take back control of its migration policy. South Korea has agreed to a second round of talks with Japan later this month in the latest attempt to end an ongoing trade dispute. Both countries have removed each other from preferential trade lists while imposing tariffs and non-tariff barriers on trade. Seoul's trade ministry says the talks are part of a dispute settlement process under the WTO rules. Trade ministers of the two countries will sit down together in Geneva on November 19. Their first Geneva meeting last month ended inconclusively. Both agreed to resume talks after South Korean President Moon Jae-in and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe met in Bangkok. If talks fail to bear fruit in two months, a World Trade Organization panel will look into the case. Lebanon's caretaker Prime Minister Saad al-Hariri says he will continue talks with the head of state and other parties. Hariri was speaking after meeting uh, President Michael Ohn. Hariri resigned as Prime Minister last week, forced out by a wave of protests against the ruling elite that swept Lebanon after October 17th. Meanwhile, thousands of Lebanese protesters, mostly women, held a candlelight vigil in Beirut in support of the demonstrations. The protesters are demanding the government be replaced with a cabinet of technocrats who would hold an early parliamentary election. The World Bank has also urged Lebanon to quickly form a new government. It warned an economic downturn would deepen poverty and worsen unemployment. A delegation of parliamentarians from ASEAN have expressed concern over the human rights situation in occupied Kashmir. Calling Indian occupied Kashmir a global dispute, the delegation assured it will raise the issue at all major international and regional forums. The ASEAN parliamentary delegation is on a four-day visit to Pakistan. It includes parliamentarians and civil society members from Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, Cambodia, Thailand, Myanmar and Singapore. Led by Malaysian Consultative Council of Islamic Organization, the group condemned Indian oppression in the valley. They also underlined their commitment to raising awareness about the situation in Kashmir in their own region. Earlier, they met Azad Jammu and Kashmir President Sardar Masood Khan. Khan told the delegation that Kashmiris have attached great expectations with the ASEAN states. The opening of the Kartarpur Corridor is a dream come true for India's Sikh community, who will finally be able to visit their holy lands after decades. Our correspondent Sumera Khan shares details on the final preparations for the inauguration of the corridor. 
construction work on the corridor which links the Sikh gurdwaras of Dera Baba Nanak and Darbar Sahib in Kartarpur has been completed. The move has been welcomed enthusiastically by the Sikh community. When I came in uh, Prayal, it was totally different. But today I can't describe in a wording what I'm looking. It it's, feels like um, you're in a heaven. Really, it's a very nice experience to come over here. Uh, I can't say how the people are friendly and very cooperative. Really, I'm proud of having a, such a good neighbor. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan will inaugurate the Kartarpur Corridor on 9th November. Former Indian cricket star and lawmaker Navjot Singh Sidhu is also invited to the ceremony. In a tweet, Indian Union Home Minister Amit Shah called the corridor a historic achievement. India has shared a list of 575 people who will be the first people to visit Gurdwara Darbar Sahib after passing through this corridor. Sikh pilgrims will not need visas to visit the shrine. 76 immigration counters have been established so far to cater to some 5,000 Sikh pilgrims from India. We have a very stringent security arrangements where we have fans, we have, we will be, it will be supported because no obstacle is obstacle less, it is protected manually. So we will have ranges with weapons outside, without weapon inside, we have police patrolling all around, we have customs, ANF to security for contraband items like, you know, drugs and other things. Pakistan has already started working on the second phase of the project, making Darbar Kartarpur Sahib the biggest Gurdwara in the world with a total area of 800 acres. With the arrival of uh, two uh, formal Sangats from New Delhi, India, Pakistan is all set to open doors of Gurdwara Kartarpur Sahib corridor for the entire Sikh community and all Guru Nanak Namlevas across the world. Reporting for Indus News, Sumaira Khan, Kartarpur Sahib corridor. And we'll take a quick short break here. We'll be back with more news. Welcome back. Now, the international credit rating agency Moody's has downgraded its outlook on India to negative from stable. Moody's said a rise in its level of debt in New Delhi's economic and institutional weaknesses led to the demotion. The agency set the nation's foreign issuer rating down, the second lowest investment grade score, India's stunted economic growth, which hit a six-year low in the April to June quarter, was another factor in the fall. Moody said New Delhi has failed to close its budget deficit and the ongoing crisis in the financial sector is undermining investment. Moody's is, a, is predicting a further slowdown in India's economy, citing weak job creation and a credit crunch. In Spain, at least nine migrants died after their dinghy capsized off the coast of the Canary Islands. Fifteen migrants were on the ship when it left Morocco five days earlier. Authorities say four people were saved by rescuers. They say nine bodies were recovered and search efforts are going on for two more missing people. Spain is one of the main European destinations for migrants attempting the dangerous journey to Europe. But the number of people illegally entering Spain has dropped compared to 2018. Spain's Interior Ministry says over 27,000 migrants have entered Spain illegally this year by sea and land. In comparison, over 53,000 entered Spain at the same time last year, a 49% decline. In Britain, the 39 Vietnamese people found dead in the back of a lorry in Essex have been formally identified. Vietnam's Ministry of Public Security said it is working to repatriate the bodies on 31 men and 8 women. In a letter to the victims' families, Vietnam's Prime Minister said the tragedy has caused them endless pain. Meanwhile, British police have arrested 15 people found in a lorry near the southern English town of Chippenham. The truck driver has been detained on suspicion of assisting their illegal entry to the UK.
U.S. pharma giant Johnson & Johnson has filed two applications for European approval of its experimental vaccine against the Ebola virus. The company's plea was filed less than a month after regulators approved Merck's vaccine. In a statement, J&J said it submitted applications to the European Medicines Agency. It said the vaccine targets the Zaire strain of the Ebola virus, which causes most outbreaks of the deadly disease. Making violins is a centuries-old art that combines the sound, feel and look in one instrument. In North Macedonia, a self-taught violin maker has been handcrafting some exceptional pieces, winning international fame in the process. The former painter says he never expected to find himself creating violins and violas. This report tells how he got there. <laughs> Years back, Svetozar Bogdanovsky could not afford to buy a violin for his son, who was an aspiring musician. <laughs> so he began making them. Years later, his son is a professional musician and Bogdanovsky's creations are famous around the world. He says he owes his success to the ideal mixture of painter and musician. Painting was my main profession and I had not been considering any other direction. The need to build violins arose when my son, then eight years old, showed great talent as a violinist. The violins are made from maple and acoustic spruce, the best for making violins in the Balkans, Bosnia in particular. The bows are also specially prepared with essential oils and raisins. The artist has so far sold more than 700 violins throughout the world, some costing tens of thousands of dollars. Each violin has something specific and unique. That's why no two are the same, even though each instrument looks just like any other. They differ from each other just as people do. Their masterpieces, violins, are played by both students and professional musicians. The prestigious Violin Society of America awarded Bogdanovsky the Certificate of Merit for Tone at their annual awards in 2012. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news.